Okay, so let's look at MIDI 2.0. Uh, why am I here? Uh, a couple years ago, uh, my colleagues and I at Art & Logic were approached by the MIDI Manufacturers Association who were getting ready after many, many years of talking about upgrades to MIDI, uh, developing a standard that they were ready to unleash on the world. And uh, we're interested in having us work with them on doing some prototyping of that spec as it was being developed, which is uh, a pretty cool thing to be involved in. And uh, so I had kind of a front seat to the, the tail end of upgrading a 37-year-old ubiquitous standard uh, that we hope was going to be wild, wildly popular in the rest of the world. So look back quickly at MIDI 1. Uh, it's been around forever, and most of you already know all of this already. But anyway, um, MIDI 1, which was originally released to the world in the early 80s, 1983, at the NAMM show, uh, was a byte stream. It was designed to run on very low-powered CPUs and microprocessors of the time over you know, copper wire pairs, uh, running short distances at relatively slow speeds, uh, so it's a byte stream. Each message inside of MIDI is either two or three bytes long to, to conserve space. You don't want to use any more bits than you have to use. Uh, most of the messages in the format were restricted to only having seven bits of data. Uh, so our maximum range of 0 to 127 of expressivity. Uh, pitch bend gets big, you know, 14 bits of resolution uh, from minus 8K to plus 8K. Uh, any one cable can carry 16 channels of MIDI data over it. And as we said, it was pretty slow, but fast by the day, the, the standards of the early 80s at 31 and a quarter K bits per second. But in a gigabit Ethernet world, it's, uh, you know, faster to walk there than it is to send a MIDI message. Sometimes it feels like. And these seven MIDI messages were defined in 1983 as part of the spec. So these are the, basically the operations you can perform over MIDI. You can send a note on, you can set a note off, uh, send a pressure message after notes are playing to everything on that channel. You can bend the pitch. Again, all notes on that channel will receive the same bend data. You can change the program or patch number that you're playing right now. Uh, there's a polyphonic pressure message, which will, would allow you to have different pressure data going out in each key, but for a bunch of reasons, it ended up not being very widely used. And control change, so anything from you know sustain pedal to filter cutoff, anything that you can send to, to control the, the sound as it's playing is a, a control change. Uh, there are other messages in there as well, you know, system exclusive, you've probably run into for patch editors and getting things set up, and channel and system common messages for, for other applications. Uh, and in the couple of decades that we've been using this, a bunch of myths have founded around uh, MIDI. Uh, nobody uses it anymore. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people since we've been involved in this who believe I don't use MIDI. I, all my keyboards now use USB, and they're not thinking that you know, it's MIDI data that just happens to be going over over the USB cable. Uh, there are people who think that nobody uses MIDI because everybody's using OSC, and a lot of people do use OSC, and where it's useful, it's great, um, but it, it has not replaced the need for MIDI. And there are people that, that have bought MPE-related gear, which we'll talk about a little later, that thing, you know, MPE is all you need now, and but it's really an enhancement on MIDI and exists strictly in terms of MIDI. Uh, we've also heard a lot of complaints uh, over the years about MIDI. It's too slow. The timing is really sloppy of the events. Uh, the controller resolution is too slow. 7-bit data is not great. There aren't enough channels. Six, 16 channels of data for a really complex piece of music is not adequate. And it can also be really hard to get things working together. And the one thing all these complaints have in common is that they're all excellent points. And the Companies that have been making MIDI gear have heard all of these for 30 years, you know, probably since a month or two after the standard was uh, published in 83. Um, on the other hand, it still makes a lot of sense as a manufacturer to build MIDI into your equipment because it's ubiquitous, it's installed in everything, it's not very expensive or complicated to implement, and as a result, uh, it just keeps building on itself. There's not a lot of worry about your product becoming outdated because you put MIDI on it. You know, I can go into my closet, pull out something from 30 years ago, plug it into my brand new MacBook, and everything is still just going to work. And I don't have a lot of technical things in my life where you can say that. 
So what happens next? I mean, if you want to upgrade and modernize something that's been used in every kind of musical context in the last 35 years, but not break any of that things, uh, what do you do? How do you go about that? So there were three rules that were followed when developing MIDI 2. Um, one is obviously pay attention to fixing and reducing all those things that people have been complaining about. Uh, two, don't break anything. Uh, causing people to need to throw away their beloved old gear would be a really, really bad thing. And the third rule was to take what MIDI does well and make it even more so. Uh, the things that make sense about it, and most of it does make sense, uh, can just be extended and enhanced and made better. So how did we change that and make MIDI 2.0? And the first question everybody asks me is, do we get a new connector? There are still a lot of people that when you say MIDI, they think of that five pin DIN on the back of their, their DX7. And yeah, originally the, the physical connector and electrical uh, protocol was as much an important part of the standard as the data protocol. But over the ensuing years, MIDI's become really comfortable running on basically any kind of transport from five pin DIN to Bluetooth to USB to Ethernet. So uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to go about this? So what we wanted to do was build in a couple different things. One, new capabilities that are going to make MIDI easier for end users to use. Uh, you know, for instance, devices will be able to automatically configure themselves to adapt to whatever they happen to be plugged into on the other end. Uh, and things that make MIDI better to use. And you could say that anything that makes it easier to use makes it better to use. But for the purposes of this, I mean, new capabilities, they're going to make it better to use on stage and in the studio once everything is connected and talking to each other. And probably the most important part of that is that unlike MIDI 1, which is strictly a one-way protocol, uh, MIDI 2 requires two-way transmissions. Uh, when you plug two pieces of MIDI 1 equipment together, nobody knows what's at the other end of the connection, or even if there is anything over there. And for simple systems, that's really fine. But as you start to add more complexity in your system, it becomes really useful to have a way to make that a closed-loop system. Uh, at the very least, when you plug your controller keyboard into a rack mount synth, it'd be nice to be able to display the name of the current patch on the keyboard, instead of having to need to remember while you're sitting there that patch 34 means electric piano or you know, have to walk across the room and look at the synth to find out what sound is going to come out. Uh, most of the new capabilities that have been added only work because connected devices will be able to ask each other what the other one knows how to do. And we've gotten used to this every place else we touch computers. Um, you know, there was a time when connecting a new printer was really a, a hassle and an all-afternoon job, and now you just plug things together by USB, they figure out what they are, and everything just usually kind of works. And the way that this has been added into MIDI is a system called MIDI CI, MIDI Capability Inquiry. And essentially everything in MIDI 2 relies on this set of operations. And this is where we need uh, two, two directional communications. Uh, when a piece of MIDI 2 gear is powered up, the first thing that it does is enter a process of discovery. Uh, or you know, you, there may be an auto config button on, on gear at some point where it goes out and queries what's out there, who's, who, who can I talk to, and what do you know how to do? Uh, once MIDI CI is in the picture, then you build what we call the three Ps on top of that. So the first of the three Ps is property exchange, where two devices can talk to each other and say, what do you know how to do? What kinds of parameters do you have? What kinds of things do you support operationally? And the second of the two Ps is profiles, which is a way to automate and make simpler configuration of devices talking to each other over MIDI. And then the third of the three Ps is protocol negotiation, which is what kind of MIDI do you speak? So since we're upgrading everything, we're going to talk in a bit about upgraded the, the, the data protocol underlying all of MIDI and some of the cool things that that lets us do. OK, so property exchange, which is really the backbone of capability inquiry. Uh, the nice thing about property exchange is that it happens over plain old existing MIDI 7-bit system exclusive messages. It's going to be really easy for manufacturers to implement this. Uh, and instead of dealing with binary data like most MIDI development is, uh, 
the decision was made when, when building property exchange, we're actually sitting around human readable text that's encoded in JSON structures, which if you've done any web development in the last five, 10 years, you've worked with, it's sensible, and it's going to be really easy to build a lot of these capabilities into both hardware and software uh, by people that may be not as comfortable going down and shifting bits around and dealing with things at that level. Uh, the MIDI 2 standard defines a set of what they call foundational resources that property exchange devices need to implement. Uh, and the, the basic foundational properties you're going to find on everything soon, uh, device info, which is a way for a piece of equipment to explain what it is. What, what is my name? What's my software version number? Who made me? Um, what's my serial number even? Uh, so if you have a couple of different of the same device on your network, you'll be able to identify them unambiguously. Uh, what are the channels that a device supports? What kind of modes? If, 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 for instance, if you have a piece of gear that supports a song mode and a loop mode, it's nice to be able to know that over the wire. And also to be able to just, if, if nothing else, get the program list that's on, on a rack mount synth back. I mean, anybody that's used a, a VST plugin is used to having all that data right there all the time and have it be able to re be recalled by name. Um, finally, that kind of capability comes to regular standalone MIDI gear. Uh, another cool thing about properties is that properties uh, are kind of rich. You can get any property, obviously. Many properties can be set over the wire. And the new thing that's going to be kind of interesting is the, the idea of being able to subscribe to a property, which will let you do things, again, because we're bidirectional, uh, consider the case where you've got a controller plugged into a rack mount synth. Right now, if you press the patch change on the keyboard, it's not surprising to be able to change the patch over on the rack mount synth. But what would be surprising, and something you could do, for instance, by subscribing to a, a property, is to have somebody change the patch on the rack mount synth and have that change be propagated back to the controller keyboard so that you always know what's going on on both ends of that. Uh, profiles, which is, again, is auto configuration. And if you've ever used general MIDI, you already get the basic idea behind a MIDI 2 profile. Uh, any general MIDI device defines has a well-defined set of preset sounds, a specific program numbers. You know that it's going to be able to receive on all 16 channels. You know that channel 10 is going to be the drums. Uh, a profile is really just a set of rules for how a receiving device that implements that profile has to respond to a chosen set of MIDI messages. Um, and this is going to permit a tighter and more both tighter and more flexible integration of controllers and MIDI receiving devices. So basically three families of profiles. There's feature profiles, instrument profiles, and then profiles for effect devices. And feature profiles are things like general MIDI, show control, note tuning. MPE is a feature profile, or will be a feature profile. Feature profile. Uh, instrument profiles lets you define things like how orchestral strings would, would behave, or a piano, or organ. And effect device profiles are exactly what you would think, having a common set of controls that interact with a family or flavor of, of device. The easy question to ask about this one is who cares? You know, I, we've, we've gone without this for a long time and we're okay, right? Um, and here's an example of why this is going to be something interesting. And consider the case of a Hammond drawbar organ. You know, everybody's seen these. And they're all the same. They've all got a keyboard. They've all got these nine drawbars for controlling the timbre of the sound and usually a control for a rotary Leslie speaker. Um, each of those drawbar controls needs to be able to send out MIDI controller data. Um, the problem is there's no standard for this. Everybody who manufactures a drawbar controller or a synth that, that responds to those is free to do whatever they want there. And there are even manufacturers that have multiple products that are not compatible within their own product family. Uh, so using MIDI CI and profiles, we can now define a drawbar organ profile and have everybody that implements it just plug together, agree that they're going to use the drawbar organ profile on a patch, and it just works. Or hypothetically, looking into the future, um, orchestral articulations. So if you've used a sample library any time in the last few years, you're used to the convention where the bottom octave or so of your, your keyboard are used as key switches. So you can have one of those notes set so that the the notes you play with your other hand are going to be pizzicato or legato. Right now, 
there's no better way to, to solve that. But with MIDI 2.0, we can have that built in and have it standardized and with note attributes, which we'll look at in a few minutes, uh, have that all built in to the controller itself rather than requiring this kind of out of band special interpretation of MIDI events to affect other MIDI events. Um, or, you know, similarly, you could have attributes that control open versus muted brass sounds or percussion techniques. And the third of the three P's is protocol negotiation. So once two devices talk to each other and start to ask, you know, what do you know how to do? They can choose to move into the new MIDI 2.0 data protocol, which is a, a system that we call universal MIDI packets. And whereas in MIDI 1, if you remember, it was a byte stream. It was the data kind of defined its own boundaries through some, you know, low-level bit level uh, trickery. Whereas in MIDI 2, everything is a packet. Everything is, all the data that goes across a MIDI 2 communication channel is one of these four sizes of universal MIDI packets, either 4, 16, or you know, up to 128 bits long, depending on the data that's carried inside of it. And this lets us do use the bandwidth a lot more flexibly. It lets us use the bandwidth a lot more uh, efficiently. And it even lets us do cool things like sneak MIDI 1 messages inside of a MIDI 2 universal MIDI packet. Uh, something we get for free with this is one of the original complaints about MIDI that we've heard for so long is the idea that 16 channels is not enough. So uni MIDI 2 universal MIDI packets not only have channels, but they also have 16 groups. So if you look at the first eight bits of every universal MIDI packet, there are four bits that tell you what type of message you're looking at. And there are you know 16 possible message types within UMP. And then what group does that message belong to? So there are 16 groups and each group can have 16 channels inside of it. So that upgrades us from 16 to 256 potential MIDI channels worth of data on one physical transport. And that's what I just said. Uh, one other thing that was added with MIDI to UMP, one of the message types is uh, MIDI to timestamps or jitter reduction. And there are a couple different methods used for this, and this is an optional thing. You don't have to use this. But if you do choose to use, if, and when I say if you choose, if the sender and receiver agree that they're going to start using jitter reduction timestamps, uh, that will prepend a one, one chunk size UMP message to the beginning of every MIDI data message that timestamps it down to a few microseconds, 32 microseconds. And this is really useful in cases like when you're recording into a DAW, where consider MIDI 1, it was all serial stream of bytes. You hold down a large chord, you know, use all 10 fingers on your keyboard, and there's going to be a noticeable difference in the time between when the first MIDI event hits the synth and when the last MIDI event from your 10th finger hits that synth. Um, if you're using timestamps, each one of those note on events is going to have the exact moment that the key was pressed down prepended, which means that when the DAW receives it, it can log the event as happening at that recorded time rather than when it received it off of the wire. So MIDI timing is going to get a lot, lot, lot better. Um, We've added a bunch of new protocol messages, and the key here is that, A, we wanted to maintain compatibility with old MIDI messages, but we also wanted to make use of increased resolution that we can have because we're on a much higher bandwidth channel now. Um, we also wanted compatibility heterogeneously in the same MIDI 1 and MIDI 2 uh, network. So all MIDI 2 devices are going to wake up as MIDI 1 device. So what that means is if you don't have any other MIDI 2 devices out there, your MIDI 2 keyboard that you buy next year is still going to be very happy to talk to your MIDI 1 gear as if nothing was wrong. Any MIDI 1 message from an existing device can be translated and possibly upscaled into a MIDI 2 message. Most or many of the MIDI 2 messages can translate back to MIDI 1. Uh, and MIDI 1 messages can travel inside of UMP. And that may may not make much sense until you remember the idea of JR timestamps, which means that now you can take an existing MIDI 1 device, 
put a timestamp on it and instantly increase its, its timing resolution, uh, which is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. Now, again, in MIDI 1, the maximum resolution on, on most of your messages was uh, 7 bits, 0 to 127, or you know, 14 bits on pitch bend. In MIDI 2, we blow that up. So velocity uh, on note on and note off goes up to 60, 64K. And all of our controllers go from 127 uh, steps of resolution up to 4 billion. So it's 32-bit control space now. Uh, which is going to allow us to build a lot more expressive systems. Uh, and with the new protocol messages, the counterparts to MIDI 1 messages all get improvements. Um, some of the MIDI 1 messages that are upscaled into MIDI 2 get new capabilities as well. And we added also some brand new messages to the standard. So under MIDI 2, node on and node off, the velocity goes from 7 bits of, of resolution up to 16 bits of resolution. And we add something new, which is a 16-bit note attribute. Um, and there are a couple of those that are preset. Manufacturers can actually use these, this 16-bit attribute word for whatever they want. But on top of that, a profile can define any special usage that it wants to have for this attribute. So like we were talking earlier about uh, orchestral profiles, being able to control the articulation data within the note on event is going to allow a lot richer kind of musical experience because each note can have its own articulation. Uh, you can also carry microtonal data with every note on and note off in, uh, message. So the 16 bits of note attribute on a note on or note off can be encoded so that it's a 7.9 fixed point uh, pitch message. So those that top seven bits would be essentially the MIDI note number. And then the next nine bits, which is basically you know, one 512th of a semitone of microtonal data to apply at the time of note on. So anybody who's done you know, microtonal or zen harmonic music and has gotten into the practice of having to set up tuning tables, which is not a lot of fun uh, to do that kind of work, now, not only do you not have to work, worry about tuning tables, but again, each note in your piece can have a completely separate tuning unrelated to what it did a measure ago or a beat ago or however long ago. Uh, program change is like MIDI 1 program change, except if you wanted to select patches from a different bank on the synth than the one you were currently on, you had to send out a couple of MIDI control messages ahead of time to get the bank set up. That's all integrated into one atomic program change message now. So it simplifies that. Uh, channel pressure after touch, again, goes from 7 to 32 bit. Control change goes from 7 to 32 bit. Pitch bend it goes from 14 to 32 bit. And we also added some new messages to MIDI 2, uh, which add more expressivity to what you're able to do. Uh, we have standalone messages for registered and assignable controllers, which you may have run into under MIDI 1 under the names RPN and NRPN. Uh, the nice thing about the MIDI 2 version, again, it's a single message. Uh, using RPNs and NRPNs under MIDI 1 required you to kind of go through a song and dance about send out some control changes to set up the RPN or NRPN that you want to be able to send a new control setting to, then send the control setting. You don't have to do that anymore. It's just a single message with 16K worth of controller numbers, 32-bit uh, MIDI 2 data, and there's also a new relative control version, which uh, is going to be useful if you're a hardware manufacturer that does something where your controllers are you know, like optical shaft encoders, and you just want to be able to say, I want to add one. I don't care where you are now. Go up one. Um, that is just part of the standard now. Also new in MIDI 2 is a lot of the per note controls that we added MPE for uh, are baked right into MIDI 2. So here's an MPE synth, uh, the Rolly Seaboard. Enough of that. Uh, so MPE, MIDI Polyphonic Expression, is a, a, a convention of usages of MIDI 1 messages. And the way that it does that is instead of having you know polyphony on a channel, 
each MIDI channel only carries data for one note. And on that channel, you can affect the pitch bend independently of the others and any of the controller data on that note. Uh, and you rotate through the channels you know, sequentially so that things don't overlap. The problem with this, obviously, is it requires explicit support at each end. Not only does your controller have to know how to generate MPE compliant data, the synth needs to know that that's what you, you're sending it and so it can re reply, respond appropriately. Um, MPE controllers all have you know, high-resolution multi-touch sensors where each finger is tracked separately, things like velocity and pressure, and in a lot of cases, you know, the actual X, Y location on a key, other parameters as well, um, and only, but they only work with MPE-aware synths. Whereas, under MIDI 2, uh, these per-note messages, if you use note on and off messages with that 7.9 pitch attribute, uh, you can have essentially 128 notes worth of polyphony uh, on a per note basis with per note pitch bend on all of those notes, per note pressure and aftertouch, per note controller data. And unlike MPE, these messages should work on any MIDI 2 synth uh, with the full MIDI 2 controller resolution and at a completely high polyphony. Uh, that's it for the protocol. The initial thing you're going to ask, at some point, a project is going to land on your desk and you're going to say, well, how do I do this? How do I make, how do I make use of this? Especially right now when there are not instruments and operating system support. So uh, part of the thing that I've been involved in for the last couple of years was working on a tool called MIDI 2 Scope, which is a debugging and generator tool that can be used to create any of the MIDI 2 channel voice messages. Uh, it can receive and display in a human readable format any of these messages. And it also has a very rudimentary kind of sequencer so you can, on, on a repeating basis, send the exact same MIDI 2 message traffic to a, a for instance, if you're developing a synth, this is how you can verify that what it's generating sound-wise is what it should be generating you know, protocol message-wise. And uh, this is a look at the uh, receive view where it's showing both three things. It's showing the raw message that came in as a hex data. It's showing a human readable version of that message so you can verify that you're, you're sending what you think you're sending. And if there are any errors in what you're sending on the wire, this will outline them in red, which is kind of a handy thing to make sure you're not gunking up uh, somebody else's uh, synth. Uh, another tool that's been developed by uh, Andrew Mee, who's a consultant working for Yamaha, is uh, a MIDI workbench that's designed to help debug and visualize MIDI CI, which is going to be an, a new enough idea for a lot of manufacturers that it's going to take uh, a while to get our head around it. And any kind of tool like this that's going to help you visualize the messages on the wire is going to be a great thing. Um, if you'd like a copy of the spec, or you'd like copies of these tools. Um, if you are with a corporation that is not a member of the MIDI Manufacturers Association, please contact whoever makes these decisions in your company and say, we've got to join. Um, if nothing else, this gets you an inside view into all the standards uh, development. Uh, always looking for volunteers to work on working groups to help drive things forward and also have a voice in how things go. Uh, it's, it's easy to complain. It's not as easy to actually be uh, on the other end making stuff work. If that's not feasible for you or you're not a, not a corporation, uh, there's also the MIDI Association, which is a, an end user uh, organization that's run by the MIDI Manufacturers Association and maintains a forum. And this is where all the spec documents are available. So if you go to midi.org, give them your email address, uh, they will set you up with an account and you can download 100% of the MIDI specs and uh, find out everything that I did not go into in this uh, whirlwind tour of uh, the high level view of MIDI 2. So let's throw it to questions. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Brett, for for this talk and taking the time. Hey, yeah, that's very weird to hear yourself talk without. <laughs> I can't remember saying that. Thanks, Brett, for this uh, really great talk. Um, can I can I ask a question? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like I don't. know, This reminds me a little bit of what we do on the Sauce Committee, where we have you know new features, but also we can't break all the old stuff. And 
and we come up with all these new features and talk about them. And then people, and people ask me, yeah, when are the compilers going to support this? And I think this is kind of a bit similar where, you know, you have all these new features, you have the new resolution, you have all these tools, and this is really exciting. But then a lot of developers, you know, they, um, you know, they write against, if you're on a Mac, something like or MIDI or on Windows, you have one of those numerous, like, semi-deprecated APIs you're going to be talking to. Or like a lot of people use something like Juice, or maybe they have like an in-house version of that, and then you just have some like mini message class that just handles that. And my question is, do you have any idea when those people, like the regular kind of developer in the trenches, will be able to benefit from this increased resolution and these new message types and um, actually use it in like actual like production like apps? Or as I like to say, use it in anger. Um, there's a couple things that have to happen between here and there. Um, right now, there's no transport mechanism for MIDI2 data. Uh, a proposal has been submitted to the USBIF, which is the organization that maintains the USB specs. Once that's done, then we can start sending MIDI UMP packets over USB. And once that happens, then companies that make things like, you know, I.O. boxes that need to be able to put USB data to, to serialize over that channel can start working on their drivers. So once the drivers are ready, then the OS vendors can start building out and de deploying their APIs. Um, neither Microsoft nor Apple are willing to say anything about what they have planned here. Um, so, you know, when they make it available, we're all going to find out at the same time, I fear. And then at that point, you know, companies like uh, the Juice guys can start to build MIDI2, you know, interface stuff into their APIs. Um, I would love it if by the time of next NAM show in January, if there is a NAM show next January, um, that there's something shipping more than what there is right now. Um, as of right now, Roland has one keyboard that they're claiming is MIDI 2 ready. Um, if you ask them what that means, they won't really tell you a straight answer. And uh, Florian Bomers, who makes the Bone Box, has has been a member of the working group working on this, and he's ready to roll as, as soon as you know USB supports this, as far as I know. So soon, but not today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's interesting because you know, obviously, like I work at a company, we have like an in-house library that does stuff, and you know, I could theoretically start using it, but then obviously, I'm talking to the APIs of the operating systems, so I can't. I have to wait for them, and I guess the Juice guys have to wait for them, and everyone has. To so it's it's frustrating. In fact, the, process, right? and then... the, the tool that I wrote, the, the way that we decided to do this for prototyping purposes, there's actually a, a secret hack where we you know, tunnel the messages through SysX. Yeah, because that was a juice tool, right? Like the yeah, ex exactly. So that, that's <laughs> just using, it's bundling UMP messages inside of a SysX package and sending it over straight old MIDI one, which we don't want real people using because it's a long term, a dumb way to do it. But as, as of you know, two years ago, it was the only way to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all this amazing work, and I hope that all this stuff happens soon and you guys should get to use it. So yeah. I thanks. hope so too. It's people still start buying gear. That's yeah. So so we have a couple uh, questions from the chat. Uh, Scott Hawley says, Brett, are there any other exciting software efforts you're involved in that are almost ready for release? That developers in this group might be interested in contributing to. Um, as a matter of fact, there is. Thank you, Dr. Holly. <laughs> um, I posted a link to it in the chat right now. Uh, we've been working with Scott Holly. For those of you who don't know him, he's a professor at Belmont University down in Nashville, um, and has been doing some really interesting work uh, identifying sounds using machine learning techniques. Uh, we developed a product with him that's just gone uh, live on GitHub. Uh, you can get the source for this uh, called Vibrary, which is a user end user trainable uh, sound machine learning recognizer. Hello, Popper. This is Toast, by the uh, way. <laughs> Software and, and I don't know if you can hear my my dog is on the other side of the door barking to to be let in right now. So. So that's Casper. That's my door. But anyway, if the link that I just posted there, artandlogic.com slash vibrary, uh, you can read up a little bit about that. And if they listen to me, it should have a link to the GitHub repo where all the code is. Great. OK, uh, so we have another question. Are there any plans or talks about reducing the latency of MIDI over internet for real-time remote performances? 
I know that's a near impossible task, but I'm just curious. Well, as, as was said in the chat, there, there's a couple different parts to that. And one is the, the overall actual latency, which is a matter of, you know, transmission speeds. You, you can't go faster than light or faster than Cisco made their router work. So you're limited there. But being able to put timestamps on MIDI uh, messages is going to improve things a lot, um, at least in instances where you're going to be recording the data. So if your data is going to be looking at uh, timestamp data that it happens to receive at crazy times, it's going to be able to reassemble them at the time that the event was generated. So for live throughput, maybe not. In fact, for live throughput, that may make things a little bit worse. But for recorded instances, it's going to make things a lot better. Uh, next question is, is MIDI 2.0 going to contain a predefined set of expression types? Um, that's going to be a, it's a separate thing. So as far as all the profiles and being able to do the uh, node attribute data, uh, that's something that there is going to be documented, a well-defined well process for creating a profile that includes those kinds of things. And anybody will be able to do that. If a manufacturer wants to embed a profile for their own unique instrument, they can do that, publish the data, and other developers will be able to make use of it. If it's something broader than that, it makes sense to kind of bring that inside of the MMA so you know a wider group of manufacturers can agree on how those things should work so that you know, people don't get left out. Great. Uh, another question is, so with MIDI 2.0, Will it become possible for MIDI 2 instruments to represent whatever SFZ sound fonts have? Did the standardization group compare the features? For example, does it also have key switches? Well, the thing is with uh, node attributes, the idea is that you no longer need key switches. So then you know, the players that, that consume the SFZ data would just need to be able to translate between those existing key switch identifiers and using the node attributes. So I think they're kind of orthogonal. Okay. And is there any information on what the support from different operating systems will be like for MIDI 2.0? I wish we knew. I, I can't wait to, to find out. Um, the people from Apple would get very prickly if you start asking them questions. Um, and I did speak with somebody from Microsoft who was much friendlier uh, about uh, that, but still not any more revealing what the plans are. Okay. And will there be something like a standard MIDI file format for 2.0, or will it be the same? Uh, yeah, in fact, there's just a new working group that's in the process of forming uh, to discuss that, which I, I, I'm joining, but uh, has not yet met. So, but yes, th there will be a, a standard MIDI file too. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure if I understand this question from Tom, but will there be a general MIDI 2.0? Uh, that's going to be, again, with uh, the profiles, uh, that's probably going to be one of the profiles that comes out is uh, General MIDI 2. Great. Okay. Well, that's, that's, all of our, that's all of our questions from the chat.